Greetings and welcome to Genetics Made Real. This is your host, Sonia Shah, and I am here today with Julie Reed. Welcome, Julie, and thank you for being here today. Hey, Sonia. It's a pleasure to be here. So you're here with a particularly interesting story regarding a family history of Huntington's disease. Why don't you explain the situation to us? Sure. My husband, Bobby, and I have been married for a few months now. We met while backpacking in Alaska as part of a college orientation trip. We're both 24 years of age and have known... And having known each other for so long, we are ready to start a family. That's wonderful. Thank you. The only trouble is that my paternal grandfather died of Huntington's disease when he was 48 years old. It's a heritable disorder, and it's a big risk factor for my and Bobby's kids if I'm affected. Ah, I understand. Before we go further, let's take a moment to explain to our listeners what Huntington's disease is and what you mean when you say it's heritable. By definition, HD is a neurodegenerative disease that results in a sudden onset of neuronal death. That is, your brain cells start to die. If that sounds painful, it's because it is. It's characterized by a striking lack in coordination and balance. Often, affected individuals have jerky body movements, dementia, and can lose the ability to talk. The symptoms can vary greatly between different people. Some suffer from rash impulsivity, difficulty swallowing, insomnia, and suicide. It's pretty horrible. My dad says he was glad when my grandpa passed away because at least then he didn't have to continue suffering. It's just crazy to think that a small genetic disorder can lead to such drastic effects. Agreed. Can you talk some about what actually causes the disease? Sure. Huntington's is usually inherited by a mutation in the Huntington gene, which codes for, you guessed it, Huntington proteins. The mutation is usually the result of a trinucleotide repeat expansion. That's just a fancy way of saying that your DNA replicated itself one too many times at a specific location and in a specific sequence, CAG. The result is an abnormal mutant Huntington protein. So all of those horrible things you were describing, they're all the result of a single mutation that makes a weird form of a protein that just happens to be essential for our brain. That's insane. Now, if I recall correctly, Huntington's is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, right? That's correct. So that means if someone who has the mutant allele, like your grandfather, will definitely be affected. Also correct. Autosomal dominant disorders are usually prenatally lethal when you have two copies of that mutant allele. That is, if you are homozygous for the disorder, this means that the individual would not survive to term. So we can assume that my grandfather only had one copy of that mutant allele. How about your father? Has he shown any traits consistent with Huntington's disease? No, he hasn't yet, thankfully. The usual onset of the disease is between ages 30 to 50. Considering he is 56 now, we are hoping that he avoided it, but there's really no telling if he may have the allele, but just hasn't been affected yet. So without knowing if your dad has a mutant genotype or not, what is the likelihood that you have it? Well, let's see. There's a one half chance that he inherited Huntington's disease from his dad, which means that there's a one fourth chance that I have it. And without knowing if I have it or not, there is a one eighth chance for each of my children. Well, it seems like you're dealing with quite a bit of stressful ambiguity here. With so many advancements in DNA genotyping technology, can you check if you have the mutant allele or not? Or is that something you don't want to explore? It's definitely a big decision to make. I have a big reason to be concerned about possibly having the mutant gene. Regardless of the effects it will have on my health, I can't help but be scared for my family. If I test positive, my parents may have to say goodbye to their daughter. Bobby would have to raise the kids alone and the kids themselves would spend so much of their lives without a mother. Not to mention the one one half possibility of passing it down to each of them. I mean, there's no cure for this. You're right, and I can't imagine how hard that is. There are definitely some promising treatments available to improve quality of life, like the drug tetrabenazine or even stem cell therapy. And research is progressing so quickly on new forms of treatment. Nonetheless, I can understand why it might be easier not knowing whether you have the Huntington's disease gene or not. Yeah, and to complicate matters further, my dad decided long ago that he does not want to know his status with regard to the Huntington's disease gene. So if I get tested, I'd be going directly against his wishes. Of course, if it turns out that I don't have the gene, it'd be wonderful for both of us. But what if I do? Then he would know that he's affected as well. 
I know I have the right to get tested even though my father does not want to know his status, but is that ethical? Yeah, but what about the ethics of the alternative option? If you don't get tested, you risk your children's health and well-being. Is the health of your future family not worth it? And even if you find out that you have the Huntington's disease gene, surely knowing will help you plan for the future. Yes, I hear you. That's what Bobby and I have been thinking too. The way I see it, if I get tested for the mutant Huntington allele, there are two outcomes. Number one, I have the disease, in which case my father does too. We can take early interventional care with my father and Bobby and I can start considering options for starting a family. Of course, this outcome comes with a lot of stress. What with knowing that my father and I have this horrible neurodegenerative disease and that our family will also have to suffer as a byproduct of our ailment. The second outcome, number two, is far happier. I test negative for Huntington's disease. It's a worry off my father's chest to know that he may not suffer like his dad did. My children are safe and they'll grow up with both of their grandparents and parents in relatively healthy conditions. That's a great and practical outlook to have. It seems like you've thought it through and made your decision. Yeah, I think I have. Phew, it's a relief to say aloud. Yeah, I bet. Now that we know your next steps, how do you go about getting tested? It's actually pretty simple. Remember before how I mentioned that the disease is characterized by a bunch of repeating CAG sequences in the Huntington gene? Yeah. Well, basically what happens is you go into any doctor's office to give a blood sample. That sample is then shipped to a lab which can isolate the location of the Huntington gene. It can then count the number of CAG repeats. So how many repeats is too many? Good question. Normal individuals usually have 28 or fewer CAG repeats, whereas those with Huntington's disease have 40 or more. Well, what about the people in that 28 to 40 range of trinucleotide repeats? They are essentially high risk for the development of that disorder. Say during DNA replication, the enzymes accidentally make too many copies of that segment of the gene. The closer you edge to 40, the more at risk you become. It's crazy that all of these processes are essentially random. There's hardly anything we can do to prevent them. I have to ask, what if the test comes back positive? Will you and Bobby still start a family? We really want to. I want to be a mom and I know Bobby just can't wait to be a dad. We could always adopt, but I think we would want to conceive at least one child. Is there a way to know if your children will also have Huntington's disease or a way to just prevent passing down the mutant allele? That gets into another realm of ethical considerations. There are two ways to tell if your fetus is affected with the gene for Huntington's disease. Chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. These are both prenatal diagnostic procedures that involve testing stem cells from the developing fetus. Based on the test results, we could decide if we want to terminate the pregnancy or not. Well, that's certainly not a decision to make lightly. No, it's not. The other way, which is way more expensive, ranging from $6,000 to $16,000, is pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic diseases. It's known as PGTM, and it's essentially a way to grow multiple embryos that are fertilized in vitro. You can then test each embryo to see if it is affected, and then implant one in the uterus. The baby then grows like normal. It's a way to avoid conceiving a pregnancy that may end in termination. It's not completely without ethical concerns, but I think it's better than an abortion. It's also worth noting that PGTM comes with many risk factors for you, the mother. Implanting an embryo has a high probability of damage, and even still, the pregnancy can fail or leave you feeling unwell. Yeah, that's true. Have you heard of exclusion testing for Huntington's disease? It's actually a, a way to avoid passing on the mutant genes without confirming whether or not you yourself are affected. So you wouldn't have to worry about compromising your dad's wishes. Oh, that's interesting. I recall it being mentioned to me once, but I don't remember all the details. Exclusion testing compares the DNA of the baby to the DNA of the parents and grandparents. It's done using DNA fingerprinting of chromosomes. Basically, it looks at the entirety of chromosome four, not just the Huntington gene, to determine if the baby received a chromosome from the affected grandparent or not. Based on that information, the baby is classified as either a high or low risk for developing Huntington's disease. However, it still involves con conception. DNA from the baby is obtained using chorionic villus sampling, 
And there is a chance that it's not wholly accurate because things like genetic recombination can always occur. That's right. I remember now. I think I would rather avoid exclusion testing because it's not entirely accurate. Plus, I don't like the idea of terminating a fetus without being as sure as possible that it is affected. Yeah, I understand that. There are some clinics that offer non-disclosure PGTM where only the lab technician knows if the embryos are affected or not. That's another way I could avoid discovering my own status, but I just feel like if I'm going to go through the tedious process, I might as well know if I carry the gene or not. It would really help Bobby and I with planning out family and our future. So it seems to me like you've chosen to first get yourself tested for the mutant Huntington gene. I really hope your worries are settled with a negative result. If not, are you going with full disclosure PGTM? Yes, I think so. That sounds like a great plan to me. Julie, thank you for sharing your story with us and educating our listeners. Making these kinds of difficult decisions takes a lot of ethical considerations, and I hope and I appreciate your being willing to be open with us. Thank you. I think it's important for people to realize the very real implications genetics has on our lives and the paths offered to us by advancements in technology. Well, that's it for this episode, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Genetics Made Real. Genetics Made Real